All right, why don't we uh, come to order here. Uh, thank you for coming out this afternoon. Uh, welcome to the American Enterprise Institute for a discussion. Uh, so my name is people we could think of to help discuss this book. Most importantly, we have Will Inboden, uh, the author of the book. Will is a professor at the University of Texas where he... Yeah. <laughs> uh, he runs the Clement Center for National Security there, which is really one of the most uh, dynamic institutions uh, in, in the country when it comes to promoting the study of uh, national security and American uh, foreign relations. Uh, and then next to him is uh, Corey Shockey, uh, who is the author of Safe Passage, a great book on the transition from uh, British to American hegemony. I believe she has worked at the NSC, the State Department, and <laughs> DOD, so she's done the trifecta. And most importantly, of course, she's my boss here as the, the head of the Foreign and Defense uh, Policy team. And so we're going to launch right into it. And the way this is going to work uh, is that Will is going to spend about 15 to 20 minutes uh, kind of introducing the book and some of its core points. Uh, Corey will offer a few comments uh, in response to the book and to Will's remarks, and then I will play traffic cop uh, and pitch some questions at Will, and then we'll open it up for, for questions from the audience uh, as well. So with that, Will, welcome to AEI, and, and please take it away. I, I, I'll stand up here to project a little better. And what, uh, what Hal neglected to uh, mention is he and Corey were both uh, incredibly helpful and supportive in the process of researching and writing this book, and they both very generously blurbed it as well. So they are hardly uh, disinterested, and I wouldn't have it any other way. So um, <laughs> it's also particularly special uh, to be talking about this book here at AEI because uh, as I look back, in a lot of ways, the I didn't realize it at the time, but the genesis of this book was here at AEI, or rather I should say AEI wouldn't it, we were at 17th and M uh, 21 years ago. I was just finishing graduate school and got a uh, dissertation fellowship at AEI for the year and was uh, fortunate to, that's right, and was uh, fortunate to be under the tutelage of Gene Kirkpatrick and Michael Novak and Jim Lilly, um, all of whom were uh, uh, very notable Reagan hands, uh, gave me some of my first exposure maybe to the, the beginnings of the oral history of the administration. So uh, little did I realize that 21 years later I'd be up here talking, talking about their, uh, their, their great legacy. Um, uh, a couple things I want to highlight about the book, uh, a user's guide I, I suppose you could say uh, for any of you who I hope will be able to read it. The first is I wrote it as a narrative, and this was my first time taking on narrative history. I found it to be the most challenging type of history I'd ever tried, tried to write, but also in some ways the most enjoyable. I did that partly because I wanted the book to have a, a broader appeal to be crafted as a story, uh, to be more you know, readable to uh, a wider ranging audience. Uh, my dear mother has read it and she approves of it, so anyway, <laughs> that's the only review that matters. New York Times, eat your heart out, right? So. Um, but more seriously, uh, I wrote it as a narrative because embedded within the narrative is a series of arguments about what matters, uh, what matters in history. And here's where I also was drawing on my uh, time as a erstwhile uh, policymaker and seeing how the policy process works and how presidential leadership works. And the, the main point is this. I worry, and I'm so honored to see a number of our University of Texas students here who were born after the Cold War. The Cold War, of course, is distant history for them. I worry about a mentality I've seen creeping in you know, across the country in elite circles and in student circles that regards the peaceful end of the Cold War as inevitable. Uh, that there were structural factors in play, and yes, there were. That of course, the Soviet Union was decrepit and bankrupt and was going to fall apart. Of course, the Cold War would end peacefully. How could it be any other way thus? And looking back, we can see that there were some deep structural trends moving in that direction. But I wanted to write the book as a narrative so that readers can see history as it was unfolding to uh, Reagan and his team, because they did not know at the time that the Cold War would end peacefully uh, and victoriously on terms favorable to, to the United States. And they were making their decisions and crafting their strategies and trying to implement them amidst uh, unfathomable pressures. You know, quite literally every day, the, the concern, this could be our last day on Earth, right? I mean, you know, the stakes could not get higher than that than the, the possibility of nuclear apocalypse uh, destroying the planet from any, any, any misperception, any wrong step, any, any, any bad decision. And so in writing the book as a narrative, I want uh, readers to be able to see history as it was unfolding, as it appeared at the time to the people making the decisions and living with the consequences of those decisions and the radical uncertainty and the radical pressures that entailed. While the Cold War is the central animating theme of the book, and it's certainly there in the subtitle, there's another reason I wrote it as a narrative and as a comprehensive history of Reagan administration policies. And I'll mention a little bit more on these in, in, a, in a moment. 
but also wanted to show that, well, scholars and journalists and analysts at think tanks uh, you may have the luxury of focusing on one issue at a time. Uh, and let's go back and understand you know, how and why did China's rise take place uh, the way that it did? Uh, how and why uh, did arms control um, processes play out the, the way that it did? For policymakers at the time, especially for the commander in chief, uh, the chief executive, the diplomat in chief, you've got an overwhelming inbox. And you're trying to devise a broader strategy in the main focus on the Cold War while also dealing with 40, 50, 60 other issues cascading in all at once. Some of them very important and um, also matters of life and death, such as terrorism. You know, every week it seems hostages being taken in the Middle East, hijacking, so on and so forth. Others of a very profound political and economic consequence, such as the, the trade tensions that we had with, with Japan and so on. And so uh, the book weaves in and out of all those different issues, again, as they were, as the Reagan, Reagan and his team were trying to navigate them. And I want readers to be able to see that even as they were working on devising the Cold War strategy, they were managing all these other issues. Some of them I think they managed quite well, and there's some great legacies there especially in Asia, others less so, uh, particularly in the, in the Middle East. Uh, turning to the, uh, the main arguments of the, of the book, and here's where I will uh, turn back to, to Cold War strategy. Um, it, is, it is this. I was wrestling with the question, what was President Reagan's end goal in the Cold, in the Cold War? As uh, uh, the great scholar Mel Leffler has put it, did he want to win it or to end it? My answer is yes to both. Uh, now, those obviously are in some tension. There can be some overlap there. Uh, and my way of making sense of this is I argue that uh, President Reagan was pursuing the Soviet Union's negotiated surrender. He very clearly wanted the, the end, the defeat of Soviet communism as a system. Uh, I don't think he would have been satisfied if it had, if it had continued, <coughs> even if its behavior had been more reformed or chastened. But he also wanted to keep the Cold War cold. Uh, he wanted to avoid it turning into a hot war and, and you know, the destruction of the world, uh, and hence the negotiated part. And so those two strands of pressure and outreach, of force and diplomacy, I see there pretty consistently throughout his eight years as president. Um, there was not a Reagan reversal. Sure, sometimes there's an emphasis more on one uh, attack than the, than the other as, as circumstances uh, is warranted. Um, and that brings to uh, another uh, insight that uh, came, came out of the, of the course of my research, which I think there's pretty good evidence for, especially with some relatively recently declassified documents from his first term, is it seems pretty clear that in devising his pressure strategy on the Soviet Union as early as 19, 1981, it was not just pressure to weaken and crack apart the Soviet system, although that was part of it. It was pressure on the Soviet system to produce a reformist leader. Uh, it, this begins, of course, when Brezhnev is the, is the Soviet premier who had very little interest in reform or negotiations or anything else with the United States. But um, Reagan and Dick Pipes, uh, who will be remembered by a number of you in here, uh, uh, were very explicit about part of our pressure is not just to improve Soviet behavior, it's not just to even crack apart the system, it's to pressure, put, force that system to produce a reformist leader with whom we can negotiate. And this is why the negotiated part of negotiated surrender is so important. So I titled the chapter in my book, When Gorbachev Does Come to Power, in March of 85, over four years after Reagan first starts uh, um, on his pressure campaign, waiting for Gorbachev, because Reagan had been waiting, looking and waiting for a reformist Soviet leader to come along. It was not Brezhnev, it was not Andropov, it was not Chernyenko. <laughs> Some of you will know his famous line, I wanted to negotiate with a Soviet leader, but they kept dying on me. Um, and, and, you know, uh, uh, rather metaphorical for the decrepitude of the, of the Soviet system. But one reason why Reagan recognized Gorbachev earlier than most others as a, a new kind of Soviet, a new kind of reformist leader is, well, when you're looking for something, you're more easily to spot it when it, when it, when it comes along. Um, uh, so, again, I, if you have a chance to read the book, I'll be, uh, uh, I hope you'll find that a persuasive theme as well. Having laid out the strategic architecture of the argument, um, uh, in the remaining time, I want to focus on two uh, particular episodes and policy lines in the book. Um, the first is what I think is a really pivotal six-week period in early in 1983. Um, which exemplifies these Reaganist themes. And then the second is his Asia policy, which uh, his Cold War policy cannot be understood apart from his Asia policy. So I think it needs to be understood as uh, central to his Asia policy, uh, central to his Cold War policy, but also important uh, legacy items we're, we're, dealing, we're dealing with uh, today. So these pivotal six weeks in um, between roughly mid-February and the end of March 1983, Three episodes happen, which may seem a little uh, jarring or uh, dis, um, incommensurate to us, but I think exemplify these different strains of Reagan's pressure and outreach strategy. The first is 
his first meeting uh, ever with any Soviet, uh, while president with any Soviet leader. And this is mid-February 1983 when he uh, meets surreptitiously with the Soviet ambassador, Anatoly Dobrynin. Um, uh, and Dropov has just come in as new Soviet premier after Brezhnev's death. Uh, Reagan has not had any contact with the Soviet leader, and he and George Shultz and his national security advisor, Bill Clark, to put together this uh, kind of private meeting on a, on a Sunday evening in the, in the White House residence. And Reagan spends about two hours with Dobrynin, trying to get to know him, leading a number of concerns. But Reagan has only one policy ask of Dobrynin, uh, and it's an interesting one. It actually baffles Dobrynin and why the American president focused on this. And that policy ask is this: release the seven Siberian Pentecostals in the basement uh, in the in the basement of the U.S. Embassy in Moscow. Why this? What's this story? Well, quick digression here: Soviet Union, of course, as an officially atheistic power. Um, it engages in you know, horrific persecution of all religious belief, especially independent Christian believers such as Pentecostals in Siberia. You know, you know, strange that they would pose a threat to the regime, but so it was regarded. So a group, uh, two Siberian uh, Pentecostal families, um, seven people in total, had been arrested in the mid-70s, thrown in the gulag for a few years uh, to you know, cure them of their religious ways. When they'd been released from the gulag in 1978, uh, they got word that they might get arrested again for going back to their worship services. And so they traveled to Moscow, and then at a moment when the gate of the U.S. Embassy in Moscow had swung open, they rushed inside the gate. Of course, an embassy is sovereign diplomatic territory. Rushed inside the gate and, and uh, apply, for, apply for asylum, seeking to go uh, get refuge in the United States. So uh, this is in the summer of 1978, and thus ensues a five-year diplomatic standoff. The Soviets, the KGB, can't go inside the embassy to get them out, uh, since that's American territory. But you can't just drive them from the embassy to the airport to fly them home, because the minute you leave the embassy, they're, uh, they're, they're um, open, open, open season on Siberian Pentecostals. And so they live in the basement of the US embassy for five years. Jimmy Carter tried to get them out and couldn't. Um, Al Haig had tried and, and couldn't. And even Reagan, even before he becomes president, has become just rather captivated by their plight, partly on a humanitarian level. Uh, you know, individual uh, cases of suffering were uh, very gripping for him. But partly because for him, the, this bizarre persecution, this torment of these Siberian Pentecostals exemplifies all the wickedness and perversity of the, of the, of the Kremlin, of the, of the Soviet system. And so when he's meeting with Dobrynin, he says, I just have one request of you will you and your government release those Siberian Pentecostals and we'll take them uh, into you know, asylum in the United States. They don't need to go back to Siberia to keep causing trouble, just let them seek, uh, seek freedom in the United States. And Reagan makes this promise. He says, if you will release them, I will never say a word about it, I won't humiliate uh, you, I won't, I won't crow about it, I won't make political hay. Uh, you know, this is a, it's a chance for us to build trust. And this is where, remember, in, in many years earlier in a previous career, Reagan had been a Hollywood labor negotiator. Um, and he prized himself in his negotiating skills. And he knew that a secret to, or a key to successful negotiations is first start small, see if you can get a few baby steps of agreement, and then build trust. And, and, it, and it worked. It took a few more months, but the Soviets um, agree to let the Siberian Pentecostals go. They're, they're spirited away. They resettle in St. Louis. Uh, and Reagan never says a word about it. And that was the, be um, the beginnings of him building trust with the Soviets for the negotiated part of negotiated surrender. But for him, it also was a part of the, the pressure campaign of um, highlighting the illegitimacy of this, of this regime, that it, would, uh, that it would persecute religious believers so. The second episode is a few weeks later, again, after he's had this uh, uh, you know, fairly successful meeting with Dobrynin. He goes before the National Association of Evangelicals in Orlando, Florida, and he calls the Soviet Union a what? An evil empire, that's right. And the context is very important. This was not just religious jingoism. He was very worried about the nuclear freeze movement. And he saw that a lot of religious groups were starting to embrace the nuclear freeze movement. He knew that KGB propaganda was behind it. And as part of his pressure campaign, he's doing the massive military buildup. And it's more than just a buildup. It's more than just throwing more money at the Pentagon. It's a modernization. And it's trying to design a next generation of weapon systems to, to outsmart rather than just outspend the Soviets. And we can talk maybe a little bit more about that in the, in the discussion. And so uh, to maintain public support for his buildup, he doesn't want part, you know, one of his key political bases, the, you know, the, uh, the evangelical right, to be abandoning him and being seduced by, by the freeze. But he also wants to speak with moral clarity um, about, about the Soviet system. And again, no American president had ever spoken of them this way before. And it was not a throwaway line. He also called them the focus of evil in the modern world. Um, 
Interestingly, uh, you know, a, a lot of his political opponents and the New York Times editorial page and everything were just apoplectic afterwards. How can an American president call the Soviet Union evil? You know, you just don't speak that way. Soviet Union was also very upset, not because they were called evil, but because they were called an empire. <laughs> Uh, because again, Marxist-Leninist uh, Marxist uh, ideology says that it's the capitalists that are the imperialists. We are anti-imperial. How dare you call us an empire, right? Um, so they were also outraged. But uh, there was also a note of encouragement. Some people took encouragement from those remarks. Uh, many of you may be familiar with the famed uh, Jewish, uh, uh, Soviet Jewish dissident, Natan Sharansky, and he was in prison at the time. And a few weeks after Reagan's speech, the guards gave Sharansky a copy of Pravda, the official Soviet newspaper, with an article denouncing Reagan for having called them an evil empire. And Sharansky tells a very moving story that he was so inspired by this. And he tapped out in you know, Morse code a note on the, the prison walls telling the other prisoners, hey, the American president finally told the truth about this wicked, wicked regime. Um, so again, dramatic escalation in the rhetorical and ideological stakes of the, of the Cold War, but part of this larger strategy. Two weeks later, Reagan gives another speech, late March of 1983, and it's the Strategic Defense Initiative speech. And this, again, is a very different tack. Um, he starts off by appealing for public support for his defense buildup, you know, wanting to maintain the pressure side of the equation. But then he engages in outreach to the Soviets, saying, I am ready to negotiate with you and work with you to reduce and even eliminate all nuclear weapons. So he's a nuclear ab abolitionist. But then he, uh, he finally says, I just want to read a, a couple of sentences from the speech, because it's really, really notable here. He's not just trying to you know, reduce or eliminate nuclear weapons. He's trying to break out of the whole framework of mutual assured destruction, the whole balance of terror on which uh, strategic stability had depended for the, for, for the Cold War. And he said, wouldn't it be better to save lives rather than to avenge them? Uh, what if free people could live secure in the knowledge that their security did not rest upon the threat of instant retaliation to deter a Soviet attack, that we could intercept and destroy strategic ballistic missiles before they reached our own soil and that of our allies? And he calls in this research plan to develop the strategic in this, uh, defense initiative. Again, there's an entire dissertation to be written just on SDI. Any aspiring PhD students here, there's a you know, free, free uh, grad doctoral uh, advice for you. Um, but for purposes of Reagan's strategy, it needs to be understood this way. He himself knew that it probably wasn't going to become operational during his time as president. You know, as a Californian and native optimist, he believed in American technology and innovation, but he knew this was fairly far-fetched. We also wanted to lay out the strategic vision, lay out the marker for how can we get beyond this crazy, this crazy arms race, defend our people from the threat of, uh, threat of nuclear, nu nuclear missiles. Um, and this, uh, if you read all the transcripts, and I've read them, and Howell's read them as well, of Reagan's meetings with Gorbachev and other Soviets, the Soviets become obsessed with SDI. Uh, even though a lot of American experts don't believe it'll ever work, it doesn't really matter because Gorbachev thinks it will work. Um, and if you trace how you know, the next several years of Reagan's, Reagan's negotiations with them, SDI becomes really the, the game changer. I do think it is one of the keys to understanding Reagan's strategy and the peaceful end, end of the Cold War. Because for the Soviets, it represents kind of that final culmination of this American strategy of uh, outsmarting them, out innovating them, making the core of their power project their strategic missile force obs ob obsolete, and they're just terrified that it might that it might actu actually work. So again, just in that six-week window, those are just a few uh, particularly, I think, noteworthy episodes, but within them is contained a multitude. It's like the entire eight years of Reagan's strategy of pressure on human rights, speaking with moral clarity about the regime, but also doing outreach, diplomacy, building trust with the, with the Soviets. And it's all designed really to keep them off balance, uh, you know, not in a, in a devious way. I mean, he's very sincere in both his outreach and his pressure and, and hatred, hatred of the regime, but it's uh, these two strands... Um, of, of confrontation and, and trust building, which we see exemplified when that reformist leader is selected. Finally, just a couple comments on, on Asia, which I um, uh, is in a really important part of the story, even if it hasn't been uh, highlighted as much in, in Reagan's legacy. Uh, obviously, the geopolitical center of the Cold War was uh, really, really there in the, in the heart of Europe, essentially from Moscow to Berlin. But uh, it was a global struggle. And for Reagan, his pressure strategy uh, towards the Soviets involved, if you will, almost you know, opening another front in the Far East. Um, and there he, he had a challenge where he inherited uh, a, a framework that was really a China first framework for American Asian policy. Um, Nixon and then Ford and then Carter, as different as uh, some of them had been, had all seen China as the key to Asia and had, you know, started a, with the opening of China, had started to bring China around as a, you know, somewhat helpful partner in, in containing the, the, the Soviet Union. 
meanwhile, the U.S.-Japan relations, even though Japan was the only democracy in the region, even though Japan was you know, one of our few formal treaty allies there, U.S.-Japan relations in the late 70s and early 80s when Reagan inherits it, it's really about trade rivalry. Right? Japan is not seen, you know, they're, they're, they have you know, a, next to nothing as a defense budget. They're not a very reliable so security partner. It's just a trade irritant, or for some American consumers, a source of uh, you know, better running Datsuns and Toyotas than our, our Fords and, and GMs were, were at the time. And so Reagan and then his Secretary of State, George Shultz, set out to transform U.S.-Asia policy. And I use that word transform intentionally. It's not just an evolution. It's really a revolution of doing a Japan-first rather than China-first strategy. Because Japan is our most important ally there, because it's the second or third largest economy in the world, because it's only the democracy, um, our only democracy, because they had some wariness about, about China. Um, and uh, through embracing Japan and managing, although not fully solving the trade rivalry, but they transform it from primarily a trade rivalry to primarily a strategic partnership. And they, uh, they persuade Japan over the next eight years to triple its defense spending. Uh, triple it. So we talk about our frustrations with allies free riding and not paying their, their share of the bargain now. I think it's a, it's a great example of uh, successful alliance management. They don't do it by publicly humiliating the Japanese, but rather by privately embracing them, reinforcing America's commitment to the alliance, and, in, and inducing Japan to do more. And it's not just tripling defense spending, it's extending Japan's maritime defense perimeter out a thousand nautical miles. This in turn frees up our seventh fleet uh, to be a little more expeditionary into the, into the Ind Indian Ocean. Um, and it absolutely terrifies the Soviets. Um, but then what about the other uh, uh, big question in Asia is what about the China relationship? And here, Reagan did a rebalancing. Doesn't completely jettison this emerging partnership with China, but he first reinforces our commitment to Taiwan. Um, under, uh, you know, again, the previous administration, there were efforts to just you know, jettison uh, Taiwan entirely. Um, but, but Reagan had uh, loyalty to Taiwan. He saw it as partly a, a moral commitment, but also partly as a, as a strategic ally. And so uh, certainly in 82, he and Schultz are uh, uh, quite deft. And you know, there's a few tactical missteps along the way, but essentially reaffirming America's commitment to Taiwan, locking in our arms sales uh, uh, to guarantee Taiwan's security uh, against uh, potential aggression with China. And having done that, having solidified the alliance with Japan, having solidified our commitment to Taiwan, that then freed them up to actually have a fairly constructive relationship with China. Um, it was a very different China at the time, uh, you know, certainly not the one we're facing today, but leads to uh, pretty extensive defense and intelligence cooperation. China becomes arguably even more important than Pakistan in supporting the Mujahideen in the 80s, uh, uh, in Afghanistan in the 80s, in the 80s for example. Um, and so again, I think we can see uh, a lot of the um, uh, fundamental building blocks of our posture in Asia today in some of this Reagan transformation in, in the region. So a lot of other things we could talk about. It's a longish book. Um, if it <laughs> seems too long to you, uh, you, you can be reassured or horrified that the first draft was about twice as long, but I, uh, my publisher's <laughs> admonition took a, took a hacksaw to it. So. Um, Hope you'll find it a good read and look forward to hearing Hal and Corey's reflections as well. So thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Will, for, for introducing the book. Uh, Corey, over to you. So even if Will Imboden wasn't one of my favorite people, I would still love this book. It's wonderful. It, you know, David, the great historian recently passed, David McCullough, uh, often used to say that the challenge of writing history is the people living it don't know how it comes out. Mm. And one of the things that's so wonderful about this book is that Will really does conjure the uncertainty in which all of these decisions were being made and carried out. And it gives a, a momentum and attention to the story that you're telling that's fabulous. The second thing I love about this book is that it accurately centers the role of religion, both in Reagan's personal um, uh, calculus, but also the role of religion and its freewheeling entrepreneurialness in American politics. And the only other person I have ever seen do that well, two people, John Meacham and um, Walter Russell Mead. So that's great company, company, and you weren't even trying to do that. So um, that's fabulous about this book, the way that that is naturally and organically threaded through the story that you're telling. I have a couple of questions um, that I'd like to draw you out on. The first is I, I want to press you for a little more proof of the case 
that Reagan actually engineered a better Soviet counterpart. Because you don't just, he's not just waiting for Gorbachev, he is, you argue, he is affecting the choice of Soviet leader by what he's doing. And I think that requires more proof than you gave in the talk, uh, because it's a really interesting and important case. My second question is, was that also true of Western leaders? That is, uh, granted that getting the, a Soviet counterparty really mattered, but for example, the British take an enormous amount of pride and credit in Margaret Thatcher having driven Reagan to good choices. And that's always seemed to me slightly puzzling and, and averts its eyes from the limits Reagan saw in that relationship. For example, the limits of assistance we gave during the Falklands War. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I'd love to draw you out on that second one. Um, and then the third one is, uh, you know, there are a lot of greatest hits that are overlooked and successes in Reagan foreign policy, but then there is also Iran-Contra. Mm -hmm. um, and so how does the decisions Reagan made about negotiations with an evil Iranian government and what does it say about his own leadership of his administration that that runs aground so badly? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, great questions. I have thoughts on all of them. How, how do you want to? Why, why don't you go ahead and respond to Corey, and then I'll, I'll jump in after that. Okay, sorry. Um, so on the first one, how much uh, credit or um, you know, agency does Reagan have in uh, the actual coming to power of Gorbachev? I don't know. And I'm not sure we ever will. And, and this gives a good chance for me to clarify or nuance it somewhat. Um, Reagan was absolutely pressing the Soviet system to produce a reformist leader. He was looking for one. This was one of his strategic goals. But Gorbachev coming to power, being selected by the Politburo in March of 85, is mostly, I think, a product of internal mysterious Soviet forces you know, uh, you know, within the Soviet system, within, within the Kremlin. So it is not by any means, and I, you know, I should not be, um, I don't want to you know, uh, uh, misstate the argument. It's not that, okay, that guy, Reagan, is making us pick Mikhail, so I guess it's going to be Mikhail, right? You know, Reagan gets the veto vote. No, not, not, not at all. But rather, I do think it's clear the Soviet system was feeling such tremendous pressure pressure uh, by, by March of 85 that they felt like they had to do something dramatic. And where was that pressure coming from? Well, a lot of it was coming from their own bankruptcy, from you know, their own inefficiencies, from their own corruption. Um, even, uh, but some of it was coming from the American side as well. I think uh, the American policies and the allied policies were accentuating that pressure. So there's a certain mysterious alchemy of all this is descending on the, the Kremlin there. Um, I'm not a Russian speaker or a Sovietologist, and so I don't want to go you know, too much further than you know, the evidence I was, I was able to glean. Uh, but uh, even though Gorbachev was picked very quickly, there were other options. They could have gone with Andrei Gromyko, for example, you know, the foreign minister who was you know, yet another troglodyte he would have been in the Andropov and, and Chernyenko mode. Um, uh, or you know, it's possible maybe if Chernyenko had lived, lived a little longer, you know, our friend Simon Miles has done, has done a, 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 lot of, a lot of work on this, there might have been some, some mild reforms. But I, I, what I want to highlight, the significance of Reagan's policy isn't so much that he made Gorbachev happen, but that because he'd been looking for that reformer and was ready to embrace and negotiate with one, he recognized him when he did come along. So that's um, an important distinction. Uh, allies, boy, again, again, could do a whole talk on allies. Um, so uh, first to state the positive case, I think Ronald Reagan is the American president in our history most committed to allies, who most valued allies, who invested the most in building good relations with allies, both on the structural level and on the personal level. Uh, he was fortunate, uh, partly through the providential turn of history, partly through uh, you know, perhaps some of his own successes, to have a great set of partners who were largely on the center-right commitment to free markets and to anti-communism. Prime Minister Nakasone in Japan is essential here. Of course, Margaret Thatcher, uh, uh, Brian Mulroney when he's elected in Canada in 1984, Helmut Kohl in, in Germany in 1983, and let's throw the Pope in there as well, right? Um, and so those six, including Reagan, um, uh, it was a great moment for Western leadership. Okay, so that's the good part of the story. Reagan also drove the Allies crazy. 
and had heated disputes with them. And this was not just at, 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 at the edges. Uh, and, they, and, they, and they in turn with him. Uh, his relationship with Thatcher, I know the best analogy would be like an old married couple, right? So deep commitment, deep love, deep mutual influence, and fighting all the time. Um, uh, over the Falklands, you know, we look back now and think, oh, what a great picture of the special relationship in Anglo-American property. Ah, not at all. I, from the start, the U.S. was a little more siding with Argentines for some a complicated part of the story. And then Weinberger does a little freelancing uh, on the side uh, uh, to, to do more support for the British, but only when it seems like the British might actually have a chance to win or at least to resolve. And also when the Argentines just turn out to be the most inept possible partners you could imagine, do we go in with them? But Thatcher feels deeply betrayed by that. But she feels even more betrayed by Grenada. Again, when we do, when Reagan lies to her, and then we do the surprise invasion of a British territory. Um, so, and then even though Thatcher famously says on Gorbachev when she meets him um, in December of '84, before he's come to power, and if he is the next Soviet leader, he's a man we can do business with. We remember that part. What we don't remember is shortly after Gorbachev comes to power, Thatcher turns on him. He's like, ah, he's just a more handsome, smiling, old-time Soviet. He's just like all those other communists. And she thinks Reagan's getting duped by him. Uh, and so, so this is where there's uh, growing frictions between. Reagan and the Allies as he's embracing, embracing Gorbachev more. Um, but he's able you know, to manage these frictions in the context of still valuing the Allies. Iran-Contra, boy, again, we could do a whole one on that. I'll just offer a few observations. Um, first, you've heard uh, some fairly fulsome praise from me, which I stand by, on the virtues of the Reagan record, the policy successes, some of the strategic vision there. He also had many liabilities, and foremost among them was he was a, a very bad manager. Um, he was conflict averse. He didn't spend a lot of time picking his people carefully. And then once he had his people in place, he uh, let them feud and bicker and stab each other in the back and leak all the time. And he often just didn't pay a whole lot of attention to, to what they were doing. Uh, and so that is you know, no, ray, no way to run a superpower, as I say at one, one point in the book. Um, and so one of the puzzles of the administration is how they had strategic successes despite such organizational dysfunction. It's against that backdrop that we need to understand Iran-Contra. Now first, here's my partially my revisionist take on Iran-Contra, and then I'll tell you why it really was a bad scandal. Um, I think, and if anyone can think of something contrary to this, come see me afterwards, it's the only scandal in presidential history I've been able to, uh, I've come across where the main actors were doing it out of entirely pure policy motives, right? So most presidential scandals are from you know, concupiscence or, uh, or greed or venality or trying to stab the Democrats in the back and raid their offices at Watergate to win re-election. Like, you know, it's always for something a little more seedy. What are the motives in Iran-Contra? Well, they're really threefold. It's to get American hostages freed. Who wants to argue with that? It's to try to improve the very troubled U.S.-Iran relationship. Okay, you know, it may not work, but it's least we're trying. And it's to try to stop the advance of communism in Nicaragua. Uh, again, um, looking at communism's uh, record, I prefer non-communist regimes in the region, right? So no one's getting rich off this. You know, none of the other, uh, so the, the motives there are pure. And yet it's still a dreadful uh, set of decisions. Uh, uh, Reagan is motivated purely by getting the hostages freed. He's less enamored of the, um, the strategic opening to, uh, to Iran, uh, but he lets his uh, uh, personal despair at the plate of the, uh, this individual suffering. As a side, his staff makes a terrible mistake when they let him meet with the hostage families. Any of you working for a president, don't let the president meet with the hostage families because he will not be able to make rational decisions after that. I couldn't either, right? I mean, if you're human, your, your heart's going to be rent by this. But... Um, and so Reagan just allows himself to be duped by these uh, you know, illusory offers of, uh, of you know, releasing hostages and, and dealing with moderates in, in Iran. McFarlane uh, wants the US opening to be Iran. Uh, his version, you know, McF just like Nixon went to China, McFarlane goes to, goes to Tehran, that's what it. I don't think Reagan knew about the, uh, the, the, the funds diversion to the Contras. I think that's more his negligence and then some freelancing by Poindexter and Ali North. But still, Reagan bears ultimate responsibility. He allowed this to fester. Uh, it nearly cripples his presidency. Um, it's, it's amazing that they were able to recover only after he finally comes clean, but it's certainly a black mark on his record. So how's going to indulge me one last question. Okay, yeah. uh, and it's about the tension in American foreign policy between values and interests. Mm -hmm. And it comes through so magnificently in the book that I want to pitch one slow and over the middle of the plate to you. <laughs> because the way you described Reagan reframing fundamental elements like mutually assured destruction. Mm -hmm finding a way to align values and interests in the same place. Um, has anybody else done that to the same level of um, excellence that Reagan has? Hmm. 
Uh, I, I don't think so. I mean, I, I got to say, you know, the further distance we get from this administration, you know, now we're, you know, 40 years after he was sworn into office, you know, uh, over 30 years after, after he elected, um, I think the, the more unique it appears. Some of this is his own strategic uh, uh, singularity. Some of this is a product of the times as well. You know, if he had actually won the primary in 76 and become president then, I don't think that the right recipe was was uh, what was in place. But um, mm -hmm. You know, Corey and I were talking last night. I mean, you know, my one sentence summary of how Reagan completely reframes the Cold War paradigm is every previous Cold War president, from Truman on up through Carter, uh, had more or less conceived of the Cold War as primarily a great power competition between two rival superpower blocks that happened to be a battle of ideas, that happened to be between two rival political systems. Reagan reverses that. He sees the Cold War as fundamentally a battle of ideas that happens to be between two rival superpower blocks. And so by putting the values and ideological part of that first, overlaid on top of the, the power calculations, the great power competition, from that flow, the whole other set of, of policies, as I've laid out, of bringing more pressure. So, so previous presidents had seen the Soviet Union as a problem to be managed, to be contained. They don't want to surrender to it. I'm not saying they were you know, a weakness or anything like that there. But Reagan's the first one who really sees it as an idea to be defeated. Um, as a, a Soviet communism, as, as an idea to be defeated. And I think uh, the time was right for that. I think it was the proper theory of the case. You know, what the apl applications of something like that would be with our challenges with China now, you know, we can give some, give some more thought to. There's some similarities and dissimilarities. How someone ought to write a book on that? Oh wait, I think someone did write a book on that. How did, so anyway, <laughs> the twilight struggle. But, um, so, and even one other thing is, Reagan is also very much a, a product of the, the 30s and 40s, the Depression and World War II. And he had seen World War II as, I think rightly, as a great moral struggle, um, but also knew that moral compromises were necessary there. And to put it rather starkly, what, you know, what is a key part of American strategy during World War II is providing billions of dollars in economic and military aid to one of the two most evil regimes on the planet, Joseph Stalin's Soviet Union. Why would we do that? Why would we so tarnish ourselves? Because we needed to do that to, be, to defeat the most evil regime on the planet, not Nazi Germany. So Reagan is aware of these trade-offs that one has to have, uh, and so sometimes pursuing that larger value question will entail some of those, uh, uh, certainly some, some of those, those trade-offs. All right, so um, I'm gonna take the prerogative just to ask a couple of questions, and then I think maybe we'll open it up uh, for questions from, from the audience. Um, so, let me, let me ask a couple of things. So the first is, you know, one of the interesting uh, characteristics of the Reagan administration, which flows out of this bureaucratic mayhem that you mentioned, is that you have rival members of the administration arguing their positions and dueling speeches at various <laughs> points of the president. Perhaps the most famous example of this is the Schultz-Weinberger debate over the use of force and the purposes of force in kind of 83, 84, yeah. 85. And so I, I wonder, um, you know, it, it seems resonant today, given that we're coming out of a period of 20 years uh, characterized by major military involvements, and that's led to similar debates about the role of force in American foreign policy today. So maybe kind of if you could walk us through that debate as it happened in the 1980s, and then perhaps reflect on what some of its lessons are mm -hmm. today. And then the second thing I'd ask you to talk about is you open the book with this wonderfully uh, evocative description of Reagan's uh, address at Westminster mm -hmm. uh, in 1982, so for 40 years ago. And obviously, it's, it's a critical moment in the Cold War. It's also a critical moment in what we would now look back on as third wave democratization, right? And that's mm -hmm. obviously one of the key themes. Of, of the speech, and, and on, what, what flows from that is a Reagan administration uh, policy that's heavily engaged, not just with sort of seeing geopolitical competition as ideological competition, as you pointed out, but in dealing with um, issues of democracy promotion and democratic transitions in a variety of countries, some of them hostile, some of them more friendly. And, and so what, what was the Reagan approach to issues of democratization to the extent that there was one. And again, what, what might the lessons be as we think about US foreign policy today? Oh, thank, you. thank you very much, Hal. And I love talking about these because these are important themes in the book, but don't, don't come out as much in the headlines. So first, um, on the, the debate between Schultz and Weinberger over the use of force, uh, the Schultz doctrine and the Weinberger doctrine, uh, on one level, um, Schultz and Weinberger are two of the most intellectually interesting cabinet secretaries, national security officials, 
in you know, the last, last 50 years, right? Um, th they are seriously engaged in the ideas behind their own responsibilities of diplomacy and, and, and defense policy. Uh, on the other hand, going back to my comment about Reagan being an inattentive manager, it's crazy to have your Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense in the space of a few weeks giving diametrically opposed competing speeches, claiming to speak for the administration, not on ter tertiary issues, but on very fundamental strategic concepts. Um, and, and it's widely known to be that. You know, Bill Sapphire has some quite biting and very funny and very insightful columns kind of tracing the, the back and forth of the, the competing visions. Um, uh, so briefly, and, and these are both very much a product of Vietnam too, right? So just as the World War II legacy is important for understanding the Reagan administration, so is, so is Vietnam. The day Reagan is sworn into office, uh, January 20th, 1981, is eight years almost to the exact day that the last American combat troop had left, had left Vietnam, and about six years uh, after South Vietnam had fallen. So Vietnam isn't history to them, it's yesterday, right? It's, it's yeah, very much there. Uh, and so the question coming out of that is, what are the lessons for the American use of force, uh, for uh, American defense policy in light of the lessons of Vietnam? For Weinberger, it's very much, you know, go hard or go home, essentially, right? You know, let's build a real large military. Let's be very, very careful about actually deploying it. If we do, let's do it with overwhelming force. It's a precursor to the, to, the, to the Powell Doctrine. And so practically what this means is Weinberger doesn't want the peacekeepers in, uh, in Beirut. Uh, and he's, I think, correct about that. Uh, he doesn't want the invasion of Grenada. He doesn't want to do retaliation strikes anytime terrorists are hitting the United States. He only wants to build a very large, sophisticated military to deter Soviet aggression, but never to actually be used, used in combat. Um, and he lays out some pretty sophisticated criteria for that. Schultz, the diplomat in chief, is actually much more hawkish about the use of force. Um, he does think the United, uh, he's quite prescient to actually read some of Schultz's speeches on terrorism in the early 1980s. Um, you know, keep in mind this is 20 years before 9-11. You see, he was really a time there. Uh, but he sees force and diplomacy as much more integrated, that he feels like he will be a much more effective Secretary of State doing his diplomacy, his negotiations, if he has you know, the world's most powerful military sitting right over his shoulder, uh, backed up by, by that use, use of force. Um, and so where does Reagan come down on this with these dueling cabinet secretaries? Well, in a kind of classic Reagan way, he sort of splits the difference. At the end of the day, he sides a little more with Schultz than, than Weinberger, so maybe 60-40 toward, toward Schultz. But um, uh, Reagan himself, uh, despite the you know, belligerent rhetoric, despite the massive uh, military buildup, is also very reticent about using force. So in eight years as president, he only deploys ground troops in combat once in Grenada. That's over pretty much in, 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 in a weekend. Um, uh, he doesn't send American combat troops anywhere in Central America, even though everyone's afraid that he's going to. He doesn't do retaliatory strikes after the um, uh, Marine barracks bombing in, in, in Beirut. Um, again, quick little contrast, George H.W. Bush, his successor, is only in office four years, also a very accomplished president, and he deploys uh, ground troops in combat twice in much bigger operations, Panama in 89, of course, the, the Gulf War too. Um, uh, and so, so that's where Reagan imbibes, I think, some of the Weinberger principles, even though, especially by the second term, uh, Reagan has been a little more forward-leaning on the threat of force to strengthen diplomacy. On, on the democracy part, very important part, part of the story, uh, and this is where a number of factors are coming together. A uh, phenomenal book on this is uh, Hal Brand's book about the unipolar moment, uh, tracing, of course, so, and Hal was not digging for a compliment there, but I'm dispensing them gratuitously. One of Hal's 870 excellent books. Yeah, yeah, so, so Hal writes books at the rate I write articles, so anyway, um, actually faster than that. Um, but um, a, a few things to say. First, uh, when Reagan sees the Cold War as a battle of ideas and Soviet communism as an idea to be defeated, he also realizes that you need to, you don't just beat a bad idea by showing everyone it's a bad idea. You also need to provide a better alternative. You need to show a good idea. And so for him, it's also about a positive vision for enlarging the contours of the free world. And he would talk about the free world without irony. I think it's a concept that is, is worth, worth recovering. And so this is why he's very committed to economic liberty, to open markets, to free trade, um, and also to promoting democracies and supporting the expansion of democracies, including, and this is key, and this is very risky, among America's uh, authoritarian right-wing allies, our anti-communist allies. Uh, when Reagan first takes office, he's a little ambivalent about this. He's you know, reacting in a part to, he thinks, Carter having put too much pressure on some of our right-wing allies. 
But he soon realizes, and the Falklands War is key on this, when he sees the Argentine military government engaging in a stupid inv invasion uh, and then, uh, ha you know, then handling it very stupidly and then collapsing, he realized, wow, one problem with right-wing authoritarian allies is they do stupid things and then they can fall. Remember, he's also very colored by the revolutions of 1979, the Iranian Revolution and the, Nicar the Sandinista Revolution in Nicaragua. And so he knows that if not managed carefully, sometimes a right-wing uh, military government can fall and be replaced by something much worse. And so he wants to avoid that. But by 1982, uh, when he's given his Westminster address, when he's picking George Shultz as Secretary of State, he is now embracing, I think, what you might say is a more uh, morally and politically consistent policy of supporting democracy promotion. Some of it is he and Schultz are reading the tides of history, if you will, you know, Huntington's third wave, but it wasn't so evident at the time. These are little, little shoots here and there. And so that's why over the next six years, you see active American support for peaceful democratic transitions in Philippines in 86 with people power, with, in South Korea in 87, in Taiwan in 88, 89, in Chile in 88 when they help oust um, uh, Pinoch Pinochet, of course, in Argentina, in Brazil, even in um, even in, in El Salvador, and a lot of these are driven by local forces. Right, the most credit you know needs to go to the democracy activists in South Korea and, and elsewhere. But American support is key: support for the activists and also conditioning for their aid on essentially telling these you know, these dictators, "You have to go. Your time is up." You're welcome, in the case of Marcos, to enjoy a nice penthouse uh, exile in Hawaii, right? We'll, we'll give you a soft, soft landing here, but you need to go. Um, and it's seen, it's because democracy is seen as more morally legitimate. It is seen as showing the benefits of living in the free world. Uh, and it's also seen as more stable and durable than some of these rather brittle military governments, which are prone to potentially fallen revolutions. So very important part of the Reagan legacy. All right, thank you. All right, so we've got about 10 minutes left. Why don't we open it up for, for questions? And uh, if you just wait, uh, Layla or Ben will find you with the mic. Let's go over here to, to Daniel and maybe just uh, introduce yourself and say who you are and make sure that the question ends in a question mark, please. Daniel Samet, doctoral candidate, UT Austin. To what extent will, if any, did the shortcomings of the amoral real politique of Kissinger and Nixon and then the bleeding heart naivete of the Carter administration set the stage for the successes of the Reagan years? Well, there's a there's a there's a softball. I love it. Thank you, thank you, Daniel. And <laughs> you're doing a great job in your dissertation too. So, we're just, we're just, so, um, so uh, I uh, I touch on, I just touch on the '70s rather briefly in the introductory chapter. You know, I wish I would have had more time to do a more fulsome treatment there. But uh, first, to 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 to, to be fair, um, I think that the Nixon Kissinger Ford detente framework was the appropriate policy at the time uh, that when you saw America overstretched in Vietnam um, uh, and, uh, and needing to manage Cold, cold, War, cold War tensions, buy some breathing space, um, uh, and see if there were any areas of at least some sort of accommodation with the Soviets, uh, it, 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 it made sense. The problem was uh, for uh, what was supposed to be either a, a tactical adjustment or a temporary expedient for, for a few years, uh, soon became a permanent framework, right? Uh, and it involved the United States, you know, ignoring, downplaying, disregarding Soviet oppression. That's why, uh, you know, Nixon and Kissinger were so opposed to Jackson Vanek and supporting uh, so Soviet Jewry. Uh, and as, you know, Jimmy Carter's Secretary of Defense, Harold Brown, put it, um, it, it started to amount to almost unilateral disarmament on the part of the United States, where you know we uh, when when we were building up our forces, the Soviets were building up theirs. So with detente, we say, okay, well we will stop building up our military, we'll stop building, and the Soviets kept building, right? And so this temporary uh, tactical adjustment soon turns into this. Um, permanent sea change of growing Soviet advances across the developing world and in the certainly the, mili the, the military balance. And so Reagan recognized that. He recognized that this is, um, you know, we, we've exhausted the benefits of detente and now we're reaping the bitter fruits, the bitter fruits of it well. And so we needed a change. And then also with, uh, with, 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 with Carter, um, you know, obviously Reagan is very critical of him and this is a big part of why he, why he wins in, in, in 1980. Uh, and I think he has a very valid critique of Carter for some inconsistency on human rights, which is Carter was 
uh, more zealous about flagellating American allies for their human rights abuses while downplaying or ignoring the abuses of our enemies. Right? Um, and so Reagan wants to reverse that. He says, listen, it's the communists who are the worst persecutors of uh, you know, political and religious dissidents. Let's go after them and let's give a little bit of a pass to the Argentine military government or others. But that's where uh, Reagan, within a year and a half or so, seems to realize that he had overcorrected uh, from Carter. And that's where, that's why, going back to my previous comments, um, he recalibrates to try to be a little bit more consistent, still with some tactical adjustments here and there, on, on a more uh, fulsome support for democracy and human rights. And, and in fairness to Carter, it was really under his administration that U.S. officials started to realize how potent the, the human rights line was yeah, in terms yeah. of making the Soviets yeah. squirm. And one other, in fairness to Carter, too, um, the Reagan defense buildup starts in 1979 under Jimmy Carter, right? I mean, so Carter, you know, when, once the detente has fallen apart, the Soviets invade Afghanistan, um, uh, Carter, Carter gets religion that last, you know, 18 months, if you will. And so Reagan inherits the beginnings of an improving hand there. Right. Yeah, Giselle. Uh, I'm Giselle Donnelly. I work here at AEI. Good to see you again. Uh, nice to see you well, too. Um, a question about the defense buildup. Yeah. Um, SDI and the nuclear yeah. aspect of that are sort of the headlines. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously, there was a huge conventional buildup, but also a, a, a change in the character of the operational ideas that went along with it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just to reinforce the defense of Europe, but to pose a counteroffensive threat to mm -hmm. the Soviet block. Mm -hmm. um, to what degree was the president aware of that? Was this part of the pressure, you know, an explicit part of the pressure strategy or just, um, you know, a happy outgrowth of it? Another softball. I didn't plant this question, really. No, thank you. No. Um, so uh, again, uh, another uh, fantastic dissertation topic for a future PhD student is uh, the Reagan defense modernization itself, and you know, multiple Looking ones can be can be written, written on that. Um, Looking at you guys. Yeah, that's right. So yeah. Um, so and and. Uh, First of all, I'm going to talk about some unique uh, aspects of the Reagan one. Going back to my colloquy there with Hal, a lot of this is the Reagan team are inheriting some new ideas uh, from, from the second offset, from Andy Marshall's competitive strategies framework, some of these ideas and new platforms being developed in the mid to late 70s. Okay, so, um, but what they do is they uh, certainly expand those in quantity, and then they take them also to the next level in, in, in quality. And the, the key strategic concept here is it's not just about, and this applies quite a bit to conventional forces. I'll give a couple of examples. But it's not just about building a more potent military to deter the Soviets, but also to impose costs to the Soviets, to equip and empower our allies and surrogates, you know, Stinger missiles, not just the Mujahideen, but to the Anita rebels in Angola, for example, right? Um, uh, and, of course, to strengthen the hand of diplomacy. And this applies across the full spectrum of the force. So, you know, in 81 or 82, uh, you tank experts, of whom I'm not one, can argue about which is a better tank, the T-72 or the M1. But what you can't argue about is the Warsaw Pact had about eight times as many T-72s as M1s. And so we would lose uh, in just a you know, force on force. Um, kind of, but what we had was the A-10 and then the H-64, the Apache, right? These tank killing aircraft, any one of which can take out 20 T-72s. And so no matter how many more rubles the Soviets are throwing at T-72s, uh, we, now have, we now have an edge there. They had three times as many nuclear subs as we did, but ours had better quieting technology, better sonar, um, so much better at, at, at hide, hide and seek. Um, uh, uh, you know, Soviets had world-class um, uh, radar and surface-to-air missiles for air defense, you know, protecting the air homeland, which would have made it pretty tough for our B-52s to get through. So we build the B-1 to go underneath the radar, we build cruise missiles to go underneath, and then we do the B-2 stealth to just be invisible to it entirely. Uh, so again, um, these are all uh, cost-imposing measures. They're giving us, uh, you know, a asymmetric advantage there. And Gorbachev is very aware of this, and, and this is why SDI, you know, cul culminates, uh, culminates all of this. Uh, Reagan was uh, self-conscious about this. So um, uh, he would do regularly uh, briefings with the Joint Chiefs. He was fascinated by a lot of the details of these weapon systems. He liked seeing the pictures. 
Uh, right before he flies to Reykjavik in 86, he authorizes a kind of leaked photo of the B-2, um, you know, still in development, just kind of letting the Soviets know what we've, what we've got here. Um, he, one reason he fights so fiercely for funding and deployment of the MX missile uh, is he said that'll strengthen my hand in Geneva, right? And so, and so for him, and I know I'm, I'm talking more about the nuclear stuff, but the entire, that's why we shouldn't talk about the Reagan defense buildup. We need to talk about the Reagan defense modernization because it's so much about um, the, the quality of the weapons uh, as, as well and these broader strategic purposes. All right, I think we have time for one more, so let's go to Gary Schmidt. Uh, Gary, Gary Schmidt, uh, American Enterprise Institute. Uh, well, you really sort of pricked a lot of memories. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, one, just one comment. I, I mean, I do think a really, and perhaps you want to comment about this, I do think a really uh, key turning point was when uh, Al Haig was replaced as Secretary of State. Yeah. It had a huge impact on all kinds of decisions that moving forward. One of the things you, you, I mean, one of the points you've made is the, about the effort to try to sort of shape how the Soviets were thinking about the competition and losing. So I'm curious in looking at the archives, one of the things, at least the small window I had and when I was working in the White House was uh, the farewell case, mm -hmm. which allowed us to sort of convince the Soviets that we had access to not only what they wanted, but we could also feed them things. Um, in ways that uh, led them into blind paths technologically, which I think in probably helped reinforce that, that view that they were behind and they had to do something substantially different. I'm curious, when you looked at the archives, how much more material was there or not? Yeah. Uh, again, I, I didn't plant this question, but thank you, Gary. So, um, uh, so Gary, what, what Gary's referencing the farewell case is one of the most you know successful counterintelligence covert action programs in in Cold, in Cold War history. And going back to my comment about allies, um, it's a joint American French uh, operation. And even though Reagan had his frictions with you know Francois Mitterrand, the um, the French leader over uh, you know nuclear policy, and you know Mitterrand was a socialist. Mitterrand was a committed anti-communist. He hated the Soviets. And when he and Reagan first met in 1981, Mitterrand shared. He said, "Hey, you know French intelligence is running this you know spy within the KGB, and his whole job is to steal Western technology. Since the Russians were you know uh, falling way behind in the tech race, so they want to steal uh, American technology, both for their economy, especially their energy industry, as well as for their military. Uh, and rather than just stopping that, well, let's help them with their shopping list, right? So let's, you know, feed them, you know, sabotage devices um, uh, so we can track what they're doing and then blow a lot of it up. Uh, and it's, uh, it pays tremendous dividends. Um, and a, a couple of joint American-British operations uh, similarly. So uh, there's, I hadn't mentioned it earlier, but Bill Casey and the intelligence side of the, of the Cold War is a very important, very important part, part, part of the story. Um, and you know, it's partly because Casey saw his mission as waging war on communism, right? So he, was, uh, he paid less attention on the analytic side and much more on the, on the operational side. All right, well, I think we could keep on pitching you softballs all, all after <laughs> well, but, but we've, re we've reached the hour, so we should, we should bring it to a close. Um, I highly recommend the book. It's, it's really tremendous. It's gonna be the standard work on this period for a long, long time to come. So if you don't have it, go buy it, or you can do what I did and just steal it from your, your research assistant uh, if you need that as well. Uh, Corey, thank you for, for joining us. Will, thanks as well, and congratulations on this wonderful book. Thank you.